I would like to welcome the students back uh, for our second lecture today, as well as our faculty. I know we have some new guests and friends that are here today. You are in for a treat. If it's anything like it was Tuesday, this will be another great session. Without further ado, Chairman Bernanke. Thank you very much. You came back. <laughs> That's good news. Um, as you know, today is the uh, second of four lectures on the financial crisis in the Federal Reserve. Um, I, as I said, I think it's, much, uh, it's very helpful to try to put the recent crisis and the ongoing um, recovery into a historical context. And so uh, last time we talked about the origins of central banking going back to Bank of England and, and uh, the debates of the 19th century, the origins of the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve's first great challenge, which was the Great Depression of the 1930s. And we drew some lessons from the 1930s that um, will come back and be relevant um, as we discuss uh, more recent events. Uh, today, um, I'm going to pick up the history after World War II, um, talking about some important episodes uh, uh, after the war. But I will be getting in today uh, to the beginnings of the crisis. And so uh, the latter part of today's lecture and all of next week will be uh, about the crisis. Now, um, as we go along, um, I just want to make sure you, you keep your eye on the ball. Thematically speaking, the uh, two basic uh, ideas, the two basic missions of a central bank are first macroeconomic stability, uh, maintaining stable growth and keeping inflation low and stable. Um, and of course, as you know, the uh, principal policy tool for uh, maintaining macroeconomic stability is monetary policy. In normal times, uh, the Fed or other central banks will uh, use uh, open market operations, purchases and sales of securities in markets to move interest rates up or down, and in doing so, try to create a more stable uh, macroeconomic environment. Uh, so that's an important part of uh, any central bank's mission. The other part of its mission, though, is financial stability. Uh, central banks are focused on trying to ensure that uh, the financial system is functioning properly, and in particular, they want to prevent, if possible, and if not, to mitigate the effects of a financial crisis or financial panic. And we talked last time about the lender of last resort function, the notion that in a financial panic, uh, a central bank can follow Badgett's rule of lending freely um, against good collateral at a penalty rate, and that by providing short-term uh, credit to financial institutions, uh, a central bank can offset the effects of a run or a panic and the uh, accompanying damage to the financial system and the economy. But let's move ahead and talk a little bit about the history. Um, uh, we left off at World War II, which... Uh, ended the depression, which led to um, a sharp drop in unemployment as people were put to work building uh, munitions and uh, uh, serving the home front. Um, now, one of the uh, aspects of wars that economists pay attention to is how wars get financed. And normally, wars are financed uh, very substantially by borrowing. And this was, this was not a surprise. Uh, US national debt was built up quite substantially during World War II to pay for the war. And the Fed, um, in cooperation uh, with the Treasury, uh, used its uh, ability to manage interest rates to keep interest rates low so as to um, uh, make it cheaper for the government to finance World War II. Um, so that was the role of the Fed during the war. Now, uh, after the war ended, um, the debt was still there. The government was still worried about uh, paying the interest on the national debt, which was at a very high level. Um, and so there was considerable pressure uh, on the Fed to keep interest rates low, even uh, after the war. Uh, but there was a, a drawback to that, which is that if you keep interest rates low, even as an economy is growing and recovering, uh, you're risking an overheating economy, you're risking inflation. So um, by 1951, the Fed was very concerned about inflation prospects in the United States. And after a series of complex negotiations, um, the Treasury agreed to end the arrangement and let the Fed set interest rates independently 
as needed to achieve economic stability. And that agreement was called the Fed Treasury Accord of 1951. And it was very important because it was the first clear acknowledgement um, by the government that the Federal Reserve should uh, be allowed to operate on an independent basis. And today, around the world, there's you know, a very strong consensus that central banks that operate independently will deliver better results than those which are dominated by the government. In particular, a central bank which is independent can uh, ignore short-term political pressures, for example, to, to uh, pump up the economy before an election. And in doing so, it can take a much longer uh, perspective and get better results. And the evidence for this is quite strong. And as a result, um, major central banks around the world are typically independent, which means that um, they make their decisions uh, irrespective of short-term political pressures. Now, in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, the primary concern of, uh, of the Fed was macroeconomic stability. Um, you see a picture there of the chairman, William McChesney Martin. He was chairman from 1951 to 1970. Uh, 19 years, uh, he was the leader of the Fed. Uh, chairman Greenspan's term ended at 18 years, six months. He unfortunately didn't break the record. I know he was very disappointed about that. <laughs> but uh, in that case, we had uh, two Federal Reserve chairmen who between them accounted for more than 37 years of leadership uh, at the Fed during the post-war period. Now, uh, monetary policy during the 50s and early 60s was relatively simple. The economy was growing, uh, again, as after World War I, after World War II, the U.S. economy was dominant. Um, the uh, fears about a renewed depression had not come true. And uh, as a result, uh, a lot of growth was occurring. What the Fed tried to do, basically, was follow what's called a lean against the wind monetary policy, which means that when the economy is growing quickly, or perhaps too quickly, the Fed tightens to try to restrain overheating. And when the economy is growing more slowly, uh, the Fed lowers interest rates, creates some expansionary stimulus um, in order to uh, avoid um, uh, a recession. Um, William Chesney Martin uh, was uh, very attentive to the risks of inflation. Uh, he's having a quote there from him, inflation is a thief in the night. Um, and he tried through this lean against the wind policy to um, keep inflation and growth stable. And indeed, despite the fact that the 50s were perhaps more tumultuous than you might think, um, there were, after all, uh, there was, after all, a serious war in Korea. There were a couple of recessions during that decade. Nevertheless, it was basically a productive and prosperous decade as the economy uh, went back to civilian um, uh, operations after the end of World War II. However, as usual, things were not to be remain completely trouble-free. Um, starting in the mid-1960s, for a variety of reasons which I'll talk about, monetary policy became too easy. Um, and after a period of time, and uh, given the Fed didn't change its uh, policy stance, uh, this easy monetary policy led to a surge in inflation and inflation expectations. And on the right, you see a graph of inflation, you can see from 1960 to 64, inflation averaged only a little over 1% a year. It picked up uh, during the Vietnam period, 65 to 69, even higher in the early 70s. But by the end of the 70s, uh, the CPI inflation rate peaked at about 13%. So you can see inflation was a growing problem starting in the mid-60s and into the 70s. So an important question is, you know, why why was monetary policy so easy as to allow uh, inflation to become a, a problem in, in the 70s? Um, well, one issue was uh, really a technical issue, which was that uh, monetary policymakers uh, became too optimistic about how hot the, the economy could run without generating inflation pressures. There was a general view that unemployment could be kept at the low level, like 3 or 4%. Uh, and by keeping inflation a little bit higher, uh, you would be able to get that better performance, that higher employment level. And uh, again, in the prosperity of the 50s and the early 60s, uh, the Fed uh, uh, began to follow that, that approach. There was uh, actually quite a, a subtle issue here, which was 
that uh, economic uh, theory and practice in the 50s and early 60s uh, suggested that there was a permanent trade-off between inflation and, and employment, the notion being that if we could just keep inflation a little bit above normal, that we could get permanent in, uh, increases in employment, permanent reductions in unemployment. And that was the view that was taken by many economists uh, during that time. Um, it was actually uh, Milton Friedman, the famous monetary economist, who wrote in the mid-60s, quite prophetically, that, that this was going to cause trouble. And he argued that uh, increase in inflation may give you a little bit of a bump up in employment, might, might cause unemployment to fall for a while, but at best that's going to be a transitory effect. Um, the uh, analogy might be to a candy bar. If you take a candy bar in the short run, it gives you a little bit of a burst of energy, but after a while it just makes you fat. Uh, so monetary policy was analogous to that. Uh, and Friedman argued, and he turned out to be quite prescient, that attempts to keep unemployment too low through monetary policy were going to end up creating inflation. Um, so that doctrinal issue uh, was one reason why monetary policy was too easy. Um, there are also uh, debates still today about whether or not there were political pressures put on the Fed. Um, after all, this was a period of, uh, again, of government deficits as the government was trying to deal with Vietnam, was trying to deal with the Great Society. Um, and uh, that may have also influenced um, uh, the Fed's behavior. Uh, now, the Fed, uh, obviously, you can't have uh, sustained inflation without uh, monetary policy being too easy. Another famous quote from Milton Friedman is that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, nevertheless, there were a bunch of exacerbating factors that made the problem worse and made it more difficult for the Fed to offset the increase in inflation. First, uh, there were a number of uh, shocks to the prices of oil and food. Um, a, uh, a very striking example was in 1973. In October of 1973, uh, the Yom Kippur War in the Middle East broke out um, in retaliation to uh, U.S. support of Israel, uh, the OPEC, the uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, um, found some uh, cartel power, uh, put an embargo on, on oil exports, and in a short period of time, um, in the early 1970s, the uh, price of oil almost quadrupled. So a very sharp increase in oil prices and thus in gas prices. Um, people were uh, lining up at uh, gas stations to make sure their gas tanks were full. There was a system of even odd rationing. If, you're, if your license plate was even, you could only go on Tuesdays and Thursdays to the gas station. If it was odd, you could go on Mondays and Wednesdays. So it was a very serious uh, issue, and there's a lot of unhappiness, obviously, about uh, gas prices then, as there is, of course, uh, today as well. Um, fiscal policy, I also mentioned. Uh, fiscal policy was overall uh, too loose uh, during the late 60s and early 70s. The Vietnam War and other government programs uh, uh, increased government spending and increased deficits, which put additional pressure on the capacity of the economy. Now, another uh, element that uh, I just mentioned briefly is uh, wage price controls. Um, when inflation got up to about 5% in the early 70s, uh, President Nixon introduced uh, wage price controls, that is a series of laws which forbade uh, firms from raising their prices. There were exceptions and there were all kinds of boards that tried to find exceptions and the, it was basically a very unsuccessful policy on the one hand uh, by, as you know, prices are the thermostat of an economy, they are the mechanism by which an economy functions, so putting controls on wages and prices meant that there were shortages and all kinds of other problems throughout the economy. But in addition, um, again, as Milton Friedman put it, this was like uh, dealing with an overheating um, furnace by breaking the thermostat. I mean, uh, the, the fundamental problem was the fact that there was too much aggregate demand driving up prices um, and simply uh, putting, passing a law which says people couldn't raise prices doesn't address the underlying problem of excessive uh, uh, monetary ease and excessive demand. So the wage price controls kept inflation artificially low for a couple of years, made it harder for the Fed to figure out what was going on. And when the wage price controls finally collapsed in disarray because they were creating so, much, uh, uh, pro so many problems in the economy, uh, inflation surged 
uh, as, it, as like a spring that was uh, released uh, at the end of the wage price controls. So there were a lot of reasons supporting the, um, uh, the uh, increase in inflation. I think a, a general lesson, here's a picture of Arthur Burns, who was the uh, chairman of the Fed uh, during the 1970s. And the quote is, uh, in a rapidly changing world, the opportunities for making mistakes are legion, which is certainly true. Um, I think one way to think about this whole episode is that uh, after World War II uh, and the end and the conquest of the Depression and the prosperity that they saw, economists and uh, policymakers became a little bit too confident about their ability to keep the economy on an even keel. And uh, there was the term fine-tuning, the notion that uh, the Fed and other uh, fiscal policy and other government policies could keep the economy more or less perfectly on course and not worry about uh, uh, bumps and wiggles in, in the economy. Now, that turned out to be uh, too optimistic, too hubristic. Um, and uh, we learned that uh, collectively during the 70s when the efforts of uh, policymakers resulted not in uh, the lower unemployment rate, which was the original goal, but instead uh, a higher and very sharp increase in inflation. So uh, I think one of the themes here is that, uh, and this probably applies in any complex endeavor, that a little humility never hurts. Now, there was a reaction to the uh, increase in inflation in the 70s. Uh, and the key person in uh, this uh, period is uh, Chairman Paul Volcker, uh, who remains to this day uh, an influential figure in economic policy discussions. Um, to, uh, to, to deal with uh, double-digit inflation, um, I should say first that President Carter, uh, who, whose uh, re-election was under serious threat by the poor performance of the U.S. economy, uh, appointed Paul Volcker to be the new chairman of the Fed. Um, and in part, he did so because uh, President Carter thought that Volcker was a, uh, a tough central banker who would do what was necessary to get inflation under control. And, uh, uh, Paul Volcker, who uh, stands six foot eight and smokes a big cigar, was certainly created a uh, impression of somebody who was willing to take uh, strong action. And uh, perhaps it wasn't a total coincidence. Um, so uh, Paul Volcker came into office. Um, uh, he was only in office for a few months when um, he determined that uh, strong action was needed to address the inflation problem. And in October of 79, uh, he and the Federal Open Market Committee, the policy-making committee of the Fed, uh, instituted a strong break in the way that uh, monetary policy uh, was, uh, was managed. Um, it's not really necessary to go into the details of what that break was and how it worked. Basically, what it did was allow um, the Fed to uh, raise interest rates quite sharply. And again, as you know, raising interest rates um, slows the economy, and uh, brings inflation pressures down. Um, as Paul Volcker said, to break the inflation cycle, we must have credible and disciplined monetary policy. And uh, it worked. Um, in the years after this program began, inflation fell quite sharply. You can see from 1980 to 1983, inflation fell from about uh, 12 or 13 percent all the way down to about 3%, so a relatively quick uh, decline in inflation um, uh, that uh, offset the problems of the late 70s. So in that respect, uh, the policies of the 80s were quite successful. They achieved their objective of bringing inflation under control. However, nothing is free, and uh, one of the effects of these policies uh, was to raise interest rates quite sharply um, I do remember vaguely uh, in, uh, I just got out of graduate school about uh, 81, 82, and I do remember looking at uh, uh, the possibility of buying a home and being informed that the mortgage rate for a 30-year mortgage was 18.5%. So uh, interest rates were quite high, and as you might expect, that uh, brought down um, uh, economic activity and affected inflation as well. So uh, if you look at the graph, you see this is the unemployment rate. Uh, the high interest rates, uh, which were necessary to bring down inflation, also caused a very sharp recession 
And in fact, the unemployment rate in 1982 was almost 11%, even higher than we saw in the most recent uh, recession. So there was definitely a, a, a very negative side effect from Volcker's uh, activities. Now, I think an interesting aspect of this uh, is that the political pressure, as you can imagine, on the Fed and on Chairman Volcker was, was intense. Um, uh, during this period, uh, uh, it was a common practice to uh, mail to the Fed bits of two-by-fours. And on the two-by-fours, it would say, stop killing construction or save the farmer, or whatever it might be, because the high interest rates were having very negative effects on the economy. And I have a few of these on my, on my desk, just to remind my, you know, uh, that uh, um, uh, inflation is, uh, is a concern and that we always have to pay attention to price stability. But it, this is also an example of why independence is important. Um, if Paul Volcker had been to be reelected, uh, perhaps he wouldn't have been able to sustain this policy. Uh, but instead, he maintained an independent monetary policy. He received at least sufficient support from uh, President Reagan and from the Congress. Um, and he was able to carry through the policy, uh, which again succeeded in uh, bringing inflation down. Now, uh, during the, the 70s, obviously, output and inflation were very volatile. We saw how much inflation moved around. We saw uh, that there was, a, I didn't mention, but there was a pretty sharp recession also in 1973 to 75 after the um, OPEC embargo. Um, and then, of course, there was more volatility in the early 80s as uh, Volcker brought down inflation and as the uh, economy went into recession. Now, uh, Paul Volcker left the chairmanship in 1987, and he was replaced by Alan Greenspan who, uh, again, held, uh, held the position for almost 19 years from uh, 87. Um, as the quote suggests, uh, one of the important accomplishments of Greenspan through most of his tenure was achieving greater economic stability. As he says, greater economic stability has been key to impressive growth in standards of living in the United States. So, in fact, there was so much uh, improvement in the stability of the economy that the period has been come to be known as the Great Moderation, um, as opposed to the Great Stagflation of the 70s or the Great Depression of the 30s. Now, this was a very real and striking phenomenon, the Great Moderation. Uh, the first picture here shows you the variability of real GDP growth. So the graph covers the period from 1950 all the way up, uh, essentially, to the present. Um, the line just shows you quarterly growth rates in GDP. So a sharp line, uh, a sharp uh, peak shows an increase in GDP growth. Uh, a negative uh, decline shows a fall in GDP growth. These are quarterly numbers. And so you can see the, the, the bounciness, uh, you know, periods of growth followed by periods of slower uh, growth. The, uh, the yellow bar is a one standard deviation band. Essentially, it's a measure of the average volatility of GDP growth quarter to quarter during the period between 1950 and 1986, or 85, I guess. And you can see that uh, GDP growth was pretty variable throughout the entire period. There's a lot of volatility in the economy. There were a number of recessions, including the severe ones in 73 and, and 81. Now, amazingly, Starting from about 1986, look at what happens to GDP variability between 1986 and 2007 or so. Uh, the variability from quarter to quarter is much less. And the blue line shows the average uh, variability, a one standard deviation band, for GDP growth in this uh, latter period. And, and it's just very striking how, how much more stable the economy was over this uh, 20 year or so year period. This was true not only for real GDP growth, it was also true for inflation. So again, it's the same picture, basically. Um, the line, the vertical line in the middle of the graph uh, splits the time period from pre-1986 and post-1986. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the graph shows uh, inflation quarter by quarter, as measured by the Consumer Price Index. Uh, again, the, uh, the tan uh, bar shows uh, one standard deviation uh, average volatility of inflation in the 
uh, pre-1986 period. You can see the huge spikes in inflation in the 70s. Um, and then in uh, post-86, you see much more stable, much lower uh, volatility. So both growth and inflation were much more stable uh, and a really quite remarkable to a quite remarkable extent and something that economists uh, commented on uh, quite frequently. So that was uh, so-called great moderation. Now, why? Why was the economy so much more uh, stable uh, between uh, the, the mid-80s and uh, the mid-2000s? Uh, well, there, there's lots of research on it, a lot of issues, a lot of papers. Um, I think there's a good bit of evidence that um, monetary policy played a role in creating better stability. Um, in particular, uh, Volcker's contribution was, even though his short-term efforts to uh, bring down inflation in, in the early 80s led to a high recession, led to a lot of pain, there was a payoff. And that payoff was an economy which was much more stable with low stable inflation, more stable monetary policy, uh, more confidence on the part of business people and households. And that contributed uh, very importantly to, um, uh, to broader stability. So you remember that the uh, Friedman pointed out that there was no long-term trade-off between inflation and unemployment. By keeping inflation a little higher, you couldn't permanently lower unemployment. But in a different sense, which is true, but in a different sense, uh, low and stable inflation over a long period of time does make an economy uh, more stable and uh, uh, supports uh, healthy uh, growth and productivity and economic activity. So low inflation is, a, is a, obviously a very good thing to have. And um, the reduction in inflation uh, that occurred in the 80s was really a global phenomenon. A lot of countries had inflation problems in the 80s. Uh, but all around the world, even uh, developing countries uh, brought down their inflation rates quite considerably. And that has been a, a positive for uh, economic growth and stability uh, since the mid-80s. Now, uh, not all of the uh, great moderation was caused by monetary policy. Uh, there are other factors, no doubt, uh, playing a role. Uh, I mentioned just general structural change in the economy. An example would be that um, over time, firms have learned how to manage their inventories much more effectively. Um, the practice of so-called just-in-time inventory management is a practice whereby instead of having large stocks of inventories on hand, firms only uh, acquire inputs when they need them to, uh, to produce. And without large stocks of inventories in hand, that reduces an important source of fluctuations in the economy because uh, if demand slows down and you have a big inventory, then you don't do any more production for quite a while until you, until you run down that inventory. But improved uh, management of inventories is just an example, and many others could be cited, uh, of better business practices and other factors in the economy that made things more stable. And it may also just be the case that there was uh, uh, better luck, that uh, we had fewer oil price shocks and, and other things happening. And uh, that, too, may have contributed to the, to the great moderation. But as those previous pictures showed, I, I hope it's uh, clear that it was quite a striking um, change in, in the way the economy operated after the mid-'80s. OK, now, this takes us up then into uh, to, uh, the mid-2000s. And so now, finally, um, we can uh, uh, begin to um, talk about uh, uh, financial stress and recent developments. Now, just a, a final word about the, the moder Great Moderation. Uh, one of the other aspects of that period is that there weren't any big damaging financial crises in the United States. There was a stock market crash in 1987, but it didn't do much damage. Um, a more significant uh, uh, event was the boom and bust in the dot-com stocks in the late 90s, uh, and that touched off a mild recession in 2001. But you know, one, of the, one of the inferences that people took away from the Great Moderation was not only was the economy more stable, but the financial system seemed more stable as well. And as a result, financial stability policies got uh, de-emphasized to some extent uh, during this period. Well, let's turn now, finally, to uh, the prelude to the financial crisis. Um, 
And, and what I'll do today is just talk about some of the uh, initiating triggering events, particularly the housing bubble. And again, as I said, next, we'll get uh, next week into uh, more details about uh, uh, what happened during the crisis and the Federal Reserve's response. One of the key events that uh, led ultimately to the uh, recent crisis was a big increase in house prices. So the, the graph on the right um, shows prices of existing single family homes uh, where uh, January 2000 is indexed to be 100. Uh, from the late 1990s until early 2006, house prices across the country uh, increased by about 130 percent. You can see that, that line going straight up, a very sharp increase in home prices. And as I'll discuss, at the same time that was happening, or perhaps a little bit later in the process, the lending standards for new mortgages to buy homes uh, were deteriorating. Now, clearly, a big part of what was happening uh, to create the housing bubble or the increase in housing prices was uh, psychology. Um, after all, the late 90s was a period, as you know, again, of a lot of optimism about uh, tech stocks and stock market more generally. And some of that optimism, some of that uh, psychology, uh, no doubt, uh, fed over into the housing market. So there was an increasing sense that house prices uh, would keep rising and that uh, housing was a, uh, a can't-lose investment. Um, I lived in California for a while and uh, earlier than this, but uh, there was a period during which house prices were rising and everybody, all everybody ever talked about it at cocktail parties was, you know, what's your house price now and how much money are you making on your home? And uh, it uh, kind of made working kind of unnecessary because all you had to do was uh, keep checking the real estate listings. Um, so there was a lot of uh, excitement and enthusiasm about the fact that house prices were going up and making everybody rich. Um, at the same time uh, that this was happening, uh, the standards for uh, underwriting new mortgages uh, were getting worse and worse, which in turn was bringing more and more people uh, into the housing market and pushing up uh, prices in f even further. So let's talk a bit about the uh, mortgage quality and what happened. Um, prior to the early 2000s, uh, home buyers uh, were typically asked to make a down, significant down payment, 10%, 15%, maybe 20% of the home price. And of course, they had to document their finances, their income, their assets, and so on in great detail to persuade the bank to make them a loan, which uh, in many cases might be uh, you know, four or five times their annual, their annual salary. Unfortunately, as house prices rose, uh, many lenders began to offer mortgages to less qualified borrowers, um, so-called non-prime mortgages, and these mortgages often required little or no down payment and little or no documentation. Now, I say non-prime instead of subprime. Subprime mortgages were the lowest quality mortgages in terms of the credit of the borrowers. But there were other mortgages that were below so-called prime mortgages, so-called Alt-A and other types of mortgages that were also uh, not up to the traditional standards of credit underwriting. Um, so I say non-prime. Uh, what was happening again was that essentially that uh, lenders, mortgage lenders, were uh, moving further down the credit spectrum, uh, lending to more and more people whose credit was uh, less, um, uh, less stellar. And you can see this in a number of different ways. Um, uh, on, the, uh, on the left side of this, uh, of this picture is uh, uh, the, f the share, the percentage of mortgage originations, that is, new mortgages created. Uh, that were non-prime, that is either subprime or Alt-A or some other uh, lower quality mortgage. And you can see uh, the very sharp increase, particularly in the middle of the 2000s. In 2006, almost a third of all mortgages that were originated were non-prime. Um, another indicator of the deterioration of mortgage quality in the right figure is the percent of non-prime loans with low or no documentation. Now, if you think about this, this is kind of perverse. If you're going to loan, make a loan to somebody whose credit is shaky, who doesn't have a down payment, and maybe their FICO score is low and so on, you think you would want to ask them even more questions uh, 
about their uh, income and their prospects. But in fact, it went the other way. And you can see that by 2007, 60% uh, of uh, non-prime loans had little or no documentation um, to, to uh, describe the uh, creditworthiness of, of the borrower. So there was clearly an ongoing deterioration of mortgage quality. Now, this is a situation couldn't go on forever. Um, this, this picture shows the house, uh, shows, sorry, this picture shows uh, the debt service ratio. As house prices went up and up and up, um, the amount of income uh, or the share of income being spent on your monthly mortgage payment went up. And uh, as you can see, uh, eventually the uh, mortgage payments became uh, a, a quite a large share of personal disposable income, finally reaching the point that uh, the cost of home ownership uh, was uh, high enough that it began finally to dampen the demand for new houses. And uh, as we see, that, uh, that, mortgage, that service ratio uh, collapsed going after that, basically because interest rates came down. But the main point here is that high interest rates, sorry, high, uh, uh, high in, uh, payments on, on mortgages um, finally meant that uh, there, were, there were no longer new, uh, new borrowers, new, new home purchasers, and so house prices uh, burst, bubble burst. Here's, here's a picture of, of, uh, of home prices. Uh, you can see, again, the sharp increase from the late 90s up until about 2006. Uh, but from 2006 until today, house prices have fallen uh, more than 30%. So there's been a very sharp decline in home prices across the country. Now, one comment about this picture. If you look at this picture, you might say to yourself, oh my gosh, we have a long way to go. Because as you can see, house prices today are still uh, a good bit above where they were uh, 15 years ago. But Remember, the, these prices are in dollar or nominal terms. There's no adjustment for inflation. So even if there was just 2% inflation a year, um, over a period of 15 years, that would raise prices by 30 or 40%. So if you adjust this for inflation, you get that house prices now are coming much closer to where they were uh, before the beginning of the bubble. Now, the, uh, the house price uh, collapse had some significant consequences. Um, one consequence is that uh, many people who had uh, felt rich because their home values had gone up and they had a lot of equity, suddenly they found themselves uh, underwater, which means that they, their mortgage, the amount of money they owed, was greater than the value of their home. So this is a negative equity. So, uh, this is an upside down situation where uh, the borrower is in fact um, uh, has negative wealth or negative equity in, in the home. And you can see that starting in 2007, the number of mortgages that were in negative, negative equity uh, grew very sharply. Uh, currently, there are about 12 or 13 million mortgages out of a total of about 55 million or so in the United States, so roughly uh, 20 to 25 percent of all mortgages are now currently underwater. So that's a very big change from the situation we saw um, before. Um, at the same time, uh, given the decline in house prices, given the fact that a lot of people borrowed um, more than they could afford, uh, the uh, decline in house prices also led to a big increase in mortgage delinquencies, people not paying on time and ultimately the bank um, taking over the, the property, and that's called a foreclosure, and then reselling the property uh, to somebody else. So this is mortgage delinquencies. And you can see that uh, in 2009, there were um, more than 5 million uh, mortgages uh, in, in delinquency, which is about, again, almost 10% of all mortgages. So a very, very high rate of, uh, of delinquencies. Now, of course, uh, we, what we just looked at was the effects of the house price bust on the borrowers and on the homeowners, and those are quite serious. But of course, there's another side to this, which is the lenders, the people who made the loans. Um, and obviously, with the 
something close to 10% of mortgages in delinquency, uh, banks and other holders of mortgage-related securities uh, suffered sizable losses, and that proved to be uh, an important trigger of, of the crisis. Now, there's an interesting uh, question here. Uh, in 99, 2000, 2001, we had a big increase in stock prices, including but not only uh, dot-com or tech bubble prices. Um, and that, those prices fell very sharply uh, in 2000, 2001. And a lot of paper wealth was destroyed by that. Um, and in fact, the amount of paper wealth destroyed by the decline in dot-com and other stock prices was not radically different from the amount of wealth destroyed by the, by the housing boom and bust. And yet, uh, as, you, as you know, the, uh, the dot-com bust led only to a mild recession. Uh, the 2001 recession went from, I believe, March to November of 2001. It was only eight-month recession. Um, unemployment rose, but it was not anything uh, nearly so dramatic as in the 80s or more recently. Um, and so here we had a, a, a big boom and bust in an asset price, but without too much uh, real serious or lasting damage to the financial system or the economy. Now, in, this, in, the, in the recent case, we had a housing boom and bust. Um, if we were looking back at 2001, we would, suggest, we would think that, well, that's going to cause a slowdown in the economy, but probably it won't be that serious. And uh, at, you know, that was one of the views that uh, we were discussing in, in the Fed in 2006 as we saw house prices decline. Might this, might not like, might this be like, more like the uh, 2001 episode than, than something different? And yet, of course, as we know, uh, the decline in house prices had a much bigger impact on the financial system and the economy than the decline in stock prices. And I think to understand that, it's important to make the distinction between triggers and vulnerabilities. Uh, the decline in house prices and the mortgage losses were a trigger. Um, they, to put it, use another metaphor, it was a, a match thrown on kindling. But there would not have been a conflagration unless there was a lot of dry tin tinder around. And in this case, there were vulnerabilities in the economy and the financial system that the um, uh, housing bust in some sense, set a fire. In other words, there were weaknesses in the financial system that were, that made, that transformed what might otherwise have been a modest uh, recession into a much more severe uh, crisis. Now, what were those vulnerabilities? Why, what was it about the financial system uh, of the United States and of other countries as well uh, that, that transformed the housing boom and bust into, a, again, a much more serious um, crisis. Again, we'll talk about this in much more detail uh, next week, but just to preview, uh, there were vulnerabilities in both the private sector of our financial system and also in the public sector. On the private sector, um, many borrowers and lenders took on too much debt, uh, too much leverage, and one reason they might have done that is because of the great moderation. There was 20 years of relatively calm economic and financial conditions, and people became more confident, more willing to take on more debt. The problem with taking on too much debt is that if uh, you don't have much margin, if, uh, if, you, if the value of your asset goes down, like you have value of your house, then pretty soon you find that you uh, have an asset which is worth less than the amount of money you borrowed. Um, a second problem, a uh, very important problem, was that throughout this period, uh, financial contracts, financial transactions were becoming more and more complex. Um, in ways which I'll describe, but the ability of banks and other financial institutions to monitor and measure and manage those risks uh, was not keeping up. That is, they were, they, their IT systems, their uh, resources they devoted to risk management were insufficient for them to understand fully what risks they were actually taking and how big the risks were. Um, so if you had asked a bank in 2006, well, suppose house prices fall 20%, they probably would have greatly underestimated the impact of that on their uh, balance sheet because they didn't have the capacity to, um, to measure accurately or completely the risks that they were facing. Uh, 
The third problem, which I'll come back to again, is uh, the funding side. Um, uh, financial firms uh, in a variety of contexts relied very heavily on short-term funding, like commercial paper, which can have a duration as, uh, as short as one day, or most of it is less than, uh, than 90 days. Um, so like the banks in the 19th century that were relying on deposits and making uh, loans, they had essentially on the liability side of their balance sheet, they had a very short-term liquid uh, form of liability, which is we'll see, was subject to runs in the same way that deposits were subject to runs in the 19th century. A final private sector vulnerability was um, the use of exotic financial instruments, uh, complex derivatives, and so on. Um, an example of this was the credit default swaps employed by the AIG Financial Products uh, Company. Uh, AIG used the credit default swaps essentially to sell insurance to investors um, on the complex financial instruments that the investors held. So basically what AIG was promising was that if you lose any money on these collateralized debt obligations or whatever these things are, we'll make good. As long as the economy was doing well and the financial system was doing well, then they were just collecting the premiums on this insurance essentially and there was no problem. But once things went bad, uh, their being on one side of all these bets meant that they were exposed to enormous losses which had, uh, as we'll see, very serious consequences. So those are some of the problems that uh, occurred on the, uh, in the private sector. Let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the public sector. There were also serious problems there as well. Uh, first, uh, the financial regulatory structure uh, was, had been changed, of course, a number of times. Basically, it was the same a structure that had been created in the 1930s after, uh, you know, during the Depression. And in particular, it didn't keep up with all kinds of changes in the structure of the financial system. One aspect of that was that there were many uh, important financial firms that didn't really have any serious uh, comprehensive supervision by, by any financial regulator. So an example of this was AIG, uh, which was an insurance company. Uh, the insurance regulators looked primarily at the insurance products they sold, um, the Office of Thrift, Su Thrift Supervision looked at uh, primarily at the thrift, uh, the small bank that they owed, owned. But nobody was really looking carefully at this uh, CDS uh, uh, problem that uh, I was just describing. Another category of firms that didn't have much oversight were investment banks like uh, Lehman Brothers and uh, Bear Stearns uh, and Merrill Lynch. Um, there was no statutory oversight of those firms. They had a voluntary agreement with uh, the SEC uh, for oversight, but there really was not comprehensive oversight of those firms. Um, and as I'll talk about, another group of firms was uh, the government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie and Freddie, which did have a supervisors, did have regulators, but for reasons I'll explain, were, was very, very inadequate. So there, the regulatory structure had lots of holes in it, and there were many important firms that proved important during the crisis that didn't have uh, good oversight. There were also, even where the laws provided for um, uh, regulation and supervision, uh, there were often, it often wasn't done as well as it should have been. And uh, while this was true across a whole range of agencies and, and parts of the government, let me, since I'm the Fed chairman, let me talk about the Fed. Uh, the Fed uh, made uh, mistakes in supervision and regulation. I think two I would uh, point out. One would be uh, in our supervision of banks and bank holding companies, um, we didn't press hard enough on this issue of measuring your risks. I mentioned before that a lot of banks simply didn't have the capacity to thoroughly understand the risks that they were taking. Uh, the supervisors should have pressed them harder to, to develop that capacity, and if they didn't develop that capacity, should have restricted their ability to take these risky positions. Um, I think the Fed and other bank supervisors uh, didn't press hard enough on this, and that turned out to be obviously a serious problem. Another area where uh, the Fed, uh, I think, uh, performed poorly was in consumer protection. Uh, the Fed had some authorities to uh, provide some protections to uh, mortgage borrowers that would have, uh, if uh, used uh, effectively, would have reduced at least some of the uh, bad lending that occurred uh, 
uh, during the, the latter part of the housing, housing bubble. Um, but uh, a variety of reasons that wasn't done, uh, not nearly to the extent it should have been. Um, in uh, 2007, uh, when I became chairman, we did undertake some of these uh, protections, but that was obviously too late to uh, avoid the um, uh, to avoid the crisis. So, uh, where there were authorities um, and powers, um, they weren't always effectively used, and uh, that obviously led to some weaknesses. And then a final, uh, and perhaps more subtle point. Uh, the way our regulatory system is set up, um, individual uh, agencies like the Fed or like uh, the OCC or the Office of Thrift Supervision typically had as their responsibility just a specific set of firms. So the Office of Thrift Supervision was only responsible for thrifts and similar institutions. Um, Unfortunately, the, the problems that arose during the crisis were much broader based than that. They, they transcended any single firm or small group of firms. They transcended the whole, the whole system. And so essentially what was, what was missing here was attention, uh, enough attention being paid to, to things that could affect the system as a whole, as opposed to just individual firms. And so nobody was really in charge of looking to see whether there were problems uh, related to the overall financial system or the relationship between different markets and different firms that could create uh, stress um, or, or even a crisis. So those were some of the vulnerabilities in the public sector. And we're going to come back to, uh, we're going to come back to these vulnerabilities and how they played out next week. Let me uh, uh, conclude here by talking about a controversial topic, which is another aspect which is the, uh, the role of monetary policy. Now, uh, many people have argued that uh, another contributor to the housing uh, bubble was the fact that the Fed kept interest rates low in the early part of the 2000s uh, following the um, uh, recession of 2001. So when the economy uh, got very weak and there was very slow job growth in 2001 and subsequently, and when inflation fell very low, the Fed cut interest rates, and in 2003, uh, the federal funds rate got down to 1%. And uh, there are people who argue that this was one of the reasons that house prices went up as much as they did. And in fact, it is true that uh, low interest rates, one of the purposes of low interest rates that the uh, monetary policy achieves is to increase the demand for housing and thereby, thereby to strengthen the economy. Now, as I say, this is very controversial. Uh, uh, but it's also very important, not only because uh, we want to understand the crisis, but because going forward, we want to think about you know, what, you know, what should we take into account when we look at monetary policy? To what extent should we be thinking about things like housing bubbles when we uh, make monetary policy? Now, we've looked at this uh, in great detail um, in, uh, inside the Fed, and there's been a lot of research outside the Fed, and I, I, let me just uh, warn you that there's no consensus on this. And you'll probably hear different points of view, but the evidence that I've seen and that, that we've done within the Fed uh, suggests that monetary policy uh, did not play an important role in raising house prices during the uh, upswing. And let me just talk a little bit about some of the evidence uh, on this question. Um, one piece of evidence is the uh, international comparison. People don't appreciate that the United States, uh, the boom and bust in the United States was, was not unique. Many, many countries around the world had booms and busts in, um, in house prices. And those booms and busts were not very closely related to the monetary policies uh, of those particular countries. For example, um, the United Kingdom uh, had a house price boom that was as big or bigger than that in the United States, but monetary policy was much tighter in the UK than it was in the United States. And so there's a bit of a puzzle for the monetary theory of the house boom. Um, another example, which is not on the slide, uh, as you know, uh, Germany and Spain uh, are both share the euro, so they have the same central bank, the European Central Bank, the same monetary policy. Uh, Germany's house prices remained absolutely flat throughout the entire crisis. Spain had an enormous house price increase, uh, considerably larger than that in the United States. So the cross-national evidence uh, raises at least some, at least some concerns. A second issue is the size of the bubble. Uh, 
Uh, it's true that changes in interest rates and mortgage rates should affect house prices and demand for homes, as I said. Um, and there is uh, a lot of history, a lot of evidence to look at that over a long period of time. But when you look at the, uh, how much interest rates changed, including mortgage rates, and how much house prices moved, uh, based on historical relationships, you can only explain a very, very small part of the increase in house prices. In other words, the increase in house prices was way too large to be explained by the relatively small change in interest rates uh, associated with monetary policy in the early part of the 2000s. Uh, the, final, the final piece of evidence I would uh, raise is the timing of the bubble. Um, Robert Schiller, a, a, an economist who was well known for his uh, work on bubbles, including the housing bubble, uh, argued that the housing bubble began in 1998 which, of course, is well before the 2001 recession and before the, um, uh, before the um, uh, cut in, uh, in, in Federal Reserve uh, interest rates. Moreover, uh, house prices rose very sharply after the tightening began in 2004. So the timing doesn't line up particularly well. Now, what the timing does suggest might be a couple of other possible explanations. One is, uh, obviously, 98 was in the, right in the middle of the tech bubble, the tech boom. And it could be that, um, uh, again, the same psychological um, optimism, the same mentality uh, that was feeding stock prices may have been feeding house prices as well. Another possibility is that, uh, that's been pointed out by a number of economists, is that in the uh, late 90s, there was a very serious financial crisis called the Asian financial crisis. Uh, that, that hit uh, a number of Asian countries and other emerging market economies as well. And one, after that crisis was tamed, one response was that many countries, emerging market countries, began to accumulate large amounts of reserves, which meant they had to acquire safe dollar assets. So there was a big increase in the demand for um, assets, including mortgages, that came from abroad as, as countries uh, decided they need to acquire uh, more dollar assets to serve as reserves. Um, I think, interestingly, probably the strongest correlation across countries uh, that you can find to house price increases is capital inflows, the amount of money coming in to buy uh, mortgages and uh, other safer, or at least perceived to be safe assets. And that timing would also fit with the 98 or so beginning. So uh, those are some arguments against the view that the monetary policy was a big source, an important source. Um, but I emphasize economists continue to debate this issue, and, and it's a very Im important issue um, because going forward, we also have to think about the implications of our low interest rates on the economy and on the financial system. And in particular, currently, just uh, out of caution, we, uh, we, we're doing a lot of uh, financial oversight and a lot of uh, regulatory uh, oversight to... Uh, make sure that, uh, or at least to do the best we can to ensure that nothing is uh, getting unbalanced in the financial system. Uh, here are a few references just to take with you if you want to get into this more. The, the bottom one is a speech I gave a couple years ago which summarizes some of the evidence. Uh, my speech is based very heavily on the second paper which is the result of all the internal Federal Reserve research. Um, there's a paper there by Carmen Reinhardt and Vincent Reinhardt which makes the point that Interest rates didn't move enough to move house prices. And uh, they also make the point about capital inflows. And then Kenneth Kuttner is a recent survey, um, which comes to the conclusion, again, that there was no, uh, no connection. But uh, again, I emphasize that this is something that is, continues to be debated. Well, what were the consequences of the crisis? We'll talk more about the crisis next time. But the uh, economic consequences were severe. Uh, here's a measure of financial stress. Uh, it's just a, a, an index which combines a variety of financial indicators that indicate that the financial system is under great stress. And you can see what happened uh, in uh, 2008, 2009. Sharp increase in financial stress in the financial markets. Um, stock market uh, plunged. Uh, we've been talking about um, the first decline there, um, where it says uh, 2000, the 2001 uh, recession. That was the very large um, decline in, uh, in tech uh, stocks. But notice the decline in the stock market in the more recent uh, recession was even bigger than the one in 2000, 2001. 
Here's home construction. You can see the very sharp decline there. Um, home construction fell before the recession because, of course, it was a trigger of the crisis. But looking to the right, you can see it, it still hasn't uh, really begun to recover. And then finally, unemployment uh, rose very sharply, uh, peaked around 10 percent, and has currently fallen down to about uh, 8.3 percent. So in the next two lectures, we're going to get into the crisis in more detail, talk about uh, how the housing boom and bust and the vulnerabilities in the financial system led to the worst financial crisis at least since the Great Depression and possibly even worse than in the Depression, and how the Fed responded to that crisis. And then in Lecture 4, we'll talk about the recession recovery and the aftermath and, and again, the policy responses there. So that's... Uh, uh, what I wanted to cover today, and we do have a few minutes, and I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. In the previous lecture, we discussed that um, the depression, it seemed that policy was tightened too early, and that led to uh, a double dip. And then today, we were discussing um, that policy in the 70s was too slow to tighten. Uh, how do we know when the right time is, and uh, is there a right time, or does it vary all the time? Well, it's, uh, it's challenging, and that's uh, certainly one of the reasons that, um, uh, you know, we, we uh, have so many uh, economists and models and everything, you know, we can use to try to figure out what the appropriate moment is to, to tighten or to ease policy. And it's not an easy thing. Forecasting is not uh, very accurate, and uh, so we have to provisionally keep looking at what's happening and making our adjustments as we go along. The 70s was particularly difficult uh, because at that time, uh, inflation expectations were not at all tied down. Uh, one thing that happened then was that if uh, gas prices went up, then people began to expect higher inflation, and then they began to go and demand higher wages to compensate for the higher prices. But then, of course, higher wages would feed through to higher prices and so on and so on. And that, in turn, was a result of the fact that everybody expected inflation to go up. Nobody had any confidence that the Fed or the government in general would keep inflation low and stable. Now, a very different situation now, fortunately, and, and this owes a lot to Paul Volcker and to Chairman Greenspan as well, is that after a long period of low inflation, most people are pretty comfortable that inflation will stay reasonably low, give it with, despite the fact that there are ups and downs, you know, with gas prices and so on. And that helps a lot, because with inflation staying low, um, the Fed has more leeway. Uh, if uh, if uh, policy is easy for a period, um, th that's not necessarily going to feed into a wage price spiral that will create a much bigger inflation problem down the road. So keeping inflation expectations low and stable is, in fact, one of the great accomplishments of uh, Chairman Volcker and, and Chairman Greenspan, and, and an important objective of central banks around the world. So the environment changes over time. It's a difficult task. Um, but the 70s was particularly difficult because at that time, uh, with expectations so uh, volatile, um, any kind of inflation pressure from gas prices, wherever, quickly fed into uh, wage demands and into other, other prices. So it was a much more difficult situation. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jonathan Cohen. So I had a question about the low interest rate monetary policy that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the early 2000s and uh, how your view and the Fe with all the different research that was conducted is that um, it didn't spark uh, the drop in housing that we had. So if, um, as in your role as, as, uh, as Fed chairman, if you were chairman now, do you think that was the I'm right... I'm chairman now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If you, if, you were, if you were chairman in, in 2001, would, mm -hmm. you have, would you have kept rates that low? And do you or if not, do you think it was the correct thing to do, although it didn't, although you don't think it affected the, um, the housing crisis? The, uh, the very first, I believe, yes, the very first speech, I was a governor of the Fed during that time. I was on the Fed board during that time. And the very first speech I wrote um, when I became a governor in 2002 um, was about uh, bubbles and financial supervision and regulation. And the theme of my speech was use the right tool for the job. The problem with tying interest rate policy to perceived bubbles in asset prices is it's like using a, a sledgehammer to, you know, kill a, kill a mosquito. I mean, uh, 
The problem is housing is only one part of the economy. If, if, and interest rates are dedicated to achieving overall economic stability. So we estimate that in order to have stopped the increase in house prices, interest rates would have been, had to have been raised very dramatically in a period where the economy was very weak. Unemployment was still above normal. Inflation was falling down towards zero. And so the, the right, generally speaking, the right, uh, the right way to use monetary policy is to achieve overall macroeconomic stability. And that doesn't mean you should ignore financial imbalances. And I think um, what we could have done, the Federal Reserve could have done, would have been to have been more aggressive on the supervisory and regulatory side to make sure, for example, that the mortgages that were being made were of better quality and that firms were appropriately monitoring their risks and so on. So I think the first line of defense should be regulation and supervision. Now, uh, I think uh, one of the lessons I talked about today was not to be too sure of anything, you know, but to be humble. And for that reason, I think we should never rule out the possibility that if all of our uh, regulatory and other types of interventions don't achieve the stability in the financial system we want, that as a last resort, monetary policy might you know, be modified to some extent to, to deal with that. But again, because monetary policy is such a blunt tool which affects all asset prices and affects the entire economy, if you can get a focused laser you know, type of tool, that's going to be much better for everybody. Yeah. End of the lecture, you mentioned the role that global imbalances played in fueling the housing bubble. Um, so doesn't the current monetary and fiscal policy that focuses on boosting consumption in the United States um, from borrowing more, doesn't that kind of lead us down the same low road of overconsumption from borrowing that we uh, had that got us into the crisis in the first place? Well, uh, first of all, the, uh, we'd like to get a better balance in general. So um, monetary policy stimulates capital formation as well. Um, it also tends to promote exports. So um, we would like to get overall, over time, we'd like to get a better balance of consumption and investment and exports, as well as government spending. Those are the main components of final demand. So monetary policy is consistent with a, a, better, a better balance. Um, but that being said, you know, we are now way below where we were before the crisis. Consumer spending has not you know, recovered. It's still quite weak relative to where it was before the crisis. Private debt has come down quite a bit. And importantly, you mentioned the global imbalances. So we're talking about the current account imbalance or the trade deficit that the US has. Um, it has come down quite significantly. Uh, so all those things have moved, you know, if anything, in some sense too far in the short run because uh, we lack a source of demand to keep the economy growing. Now, uh, again, I agree that um, just as uh, every country needs to have an appropriate balance of consumption, capital formation, exports, and government spending, and that's an important task for us going forward, um, but right now, uh, in terms of debt and consumption and so on, we're still, you know, way low relative to, to the pattern before the crisis. The latter part of your lec lecture was about monetary policy in the uh, 2000s after the dot-com uh, bubble and how interest rates were kept low, of course. Um, you argue that that wasn't a trigger to the increase in rising, uh, the increase in house prices, but to look at it from another um, point of view, could What's, what's your take on the argument that the uh, low interest rates cause private investors and banks to uh, make riskier trades because of the low interest rates at the time, and how that could have also been a trigger to the crisis? Well, that's a good question, and I think there is some effect of low interest rates on risk taking. Um, but once again, very similar to the previous question, it's, a, it's an issue of getting the right balance. Um, you know, during a recession, generally speaking, on, on most dimensions, uh, investors become very cautious. That's certainly where they've been for much of the recent past. And so, again, uh, you want to get an appropriate balance between the amount of risk being taken, not too much, not too little. And, uh, but once again, this is yet another reason why uh, financial supervision and regulation needs to be playing a role. Uh, that's, we, particularly with institutions, large institutions, banks, um, we need to be, uh, looking directly at those firms and making sure that they are managing their risks uh, appropriately. So it's, again, it's a question of what's the right tool for the job. I should go over on this side. Mr. Lippman. The slides on the housing bubble like show how clearly one thing led to another 
like rising prices and then eventually like a fall. When you were observing the economy in the 2000s, what did you think would happen like to the rising uh, house prices and the housing bubble? Did you think that it would eventually lead to a recession? And because I know there's a book called The Big Short where some mm -hmm. investors were like very prescient in, in like in shorting sh shorting that. Like, what's your take on that? Well, as I, as I tried to argue, the, the decline in house prices itself, by itself, was not obviously a, a major threat. When I was, a, when I was the chief, uh, I, was the, I was the head of the chairman, I was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Bush, and in 2005, we did an analysis for him of what would happen if house prices came down. And what we concluded was, well, we'd have a recession, but we didn't anticipate that the financial crisis, we didn't anticipate that the decline in house prices would have such a broad-based effect on the stability of the financial system. And when I became chairman in 2006, house prices were already declining. And in my two weeks after I became chairman, I gave a, a testimony where I said house prices are falling. That's going to have uh, negative impacts in the economy, and we're not sure of all the consequences and so on. So the fact that house prices might come down, uh, you know, that was always a possibility. The, the really hard thing, at least in my view, to anticipate fully was that the, the effects of the decline in house prices would be so much more severe than the, than the sort of similar decline in dot-com stocks. And again, the reason, as I'll get into more next time, is the ways in which the decline in house prices affected mortgages, affected the soundness of the financial system, and created a panic which in turn led to the instability of the financial system. So it was that whole chain of events that was critical. It was not just the decline in house prices. It was the whole chain. Uh, Miles? Amidst the dispersion of cheap credit in the years preceding the housing crisis, uh, there was a bipartisan push for American homeownership, originally spearheaded by President Clinton and later carried on by George W. Bush. To what degree could it be argued that aggressive government policies supporting increased lending during this period uh, contributed to the eventual erosion of credit standards on behalf of the mortgage originators? That's a very good question. Another controversial question. Um, certainly, there was some uh, pressure to increase home ownership. There was the American dream aspect of owning a home and so on. Home ownership rose uh, during this period. Um, but I think to put it all in the government is, is probably wrong in this case. Um, most of the, of, the, of the worst loans were made by private sector lenders and then sold to private sector, through private sector securitizations. That is, they didn't touch Fannie and Freddie, for example. They went directly to investors. Um, Fannie and Freddie did acquire uh, some subprime mortgages, but actually that was a little bit later in the process rather than at the beginning of the process. So I think there was some of this going on everywhere, but clearly the private sector you know, without any encouragement uh, from the government, was a big player in the decline in, in mortgage underwriting and in the selling of packaged mortgages to private investors. Yeah. I think one of the hallmarks of uh, the Fed under your leadership has been your commitment to transparency. And I think, you know, we're all benefits of that uh, in the room here. But I'm um, wondering whether you think perhaps too much uh, transparency could actually damage credibility of a, of a central bank, if, if you sort of get things wrong, I guess. Okay, so you're a little bit off topic here, because we didn't get to transparency today. Uh, but just generally, I think, uh, uh, I agree, uh, transparency is very important. Um, it's important for at least a couple of reasons. One is, I talked already about the importance of a central bank being independent, so there is one linkage there. Uh, but if a central bank is independent um, and making important decisions which affect everybody, then obviously it's got to be accountable. People have to understand what it's doing, why it's doing it, um, what, you know, what's the basis of its decisions. And so for democratic accountability, I think it's important for the central bank to be transparent. And um, I testify all the time. I give speeches. I have all kinds of town halls and other kinds of meetings like this. And I think it's very important for me at press conferences. I think it's very important for me to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. So that's one reason for transparency. Um, the other is that. Um, over time, there's been increased understanding that for most of the time, transparency can make monetary policy work better. So for example, if um, the Federal Reserve communicates uh, that its uh, future actions will be X or Y and conveys that information to the, the markets, 
uh, the markets may respond to that by building those expectations into interest rates and may have a more powerful effect on the economy. So communication also reduces uncertainty and helps increase the um, impact of monetary policy in financial markets. I have time only for one more. Uh, yes. And my question is in regards to price stability and inflation expectations. Uh, you mentioned the importance of that in macroeconomic stability and long-run uh, economic growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, given the massive amounts of liquidity that's been pumped in the market recently, how has the Fed been able to maintain inflation expectations so low? So you, we're going to have to come back. Let me, let me ask for us to try to stick with the particular topic. On the last day, we'll be talking about current monetary policy. We'll have plenty of opportunities. But let me just answer it just in the following very brief way which is that um, uh, I think we owe something to our predecessors in this respect, Chairman Volcker in particular, uh, and also Chairman Greenspan, you know, got inflation down low and kept it there. And uh, people get used to what they see, right? And in a world in which inflation remains low, um, you know, year after year, uh, people are going to become more and more confident that the central bank, the Fed, or whoever uh, will, will meet its mandate of keeping inflation low. And so, it, it has been uh, very striking that even though we've had movements in oil prices and uh, other shocks to the economy, a deep recession, a financial crisis, everything, throughout most of the period, um, inflation expectations have been very well tied down to about uh, the 2 percent range that uh, the Fed is trying to hit. Thanks. And next week, we'll go into uh, more into the crisis. Thank you very much. Okay, well, this has certainly exceeded my expectations, and we're grateful that you stayed all the way to 2 o'clock uh, yet again. Uh, as with Tuesday, I know that there are still pent-up questions, students, that you have. And so why don't you send one or two questions to the Blackboard site so we can capture them, so we can talk about them uh, not next week, but the following week when we have our discussions. Have a great weekend, everybody. We will see you uh, next week.